Hello and welcome back everybody. Today we are going to have a look at uh, various prominent scientific figures who discussed poltergeist style phenomena in the 19th and 20th centuries. As always, I've put a link to my sources down in the description box and I can only encourage you to uh, do your own research and readings instead of um, just relying on what I or in fact anybody else on the interwebs is saying. If you haven't watched part one of our little trip into the haunted past of modern science, I strongly recommend you uh, check it out first. In any case, here's a quick recap of what we've already learned. A major early modern hub of experimental science was the Royal Society in London. As we have seen, poltergeist phenomena were some of the controversial topics which attracted the interest of some of the early members of the Royal Society in the 1660s. Robert Boyle, for example, had a strong interest in these things and explicitly encouraged scientific colleagues to investigate reported poltergeist disturbances. And like his colleagues, Boyle tried to use scientific methods to verify rather than debunk supposedly supernatural phenomena. In contrast, we found that scientific methods had actually not a lot to do with the sharp decline of open-minded intellectual interest in things that go bump in the night during the Enlightenment. Those who practically outlawed empirical approaches to the occult were mainly polemical writers. And as the example of Lessing in Germany has shown, not all leading thinkers of the Enlightenment actually agreed with the scorched earth approach to reported occult phenomena and experiences. So let's see if we can trace any uh, continuities of scientific interest in poltergeist style phenomena in the following centuries. And I'm sure you guessed it already, the emergence of so-called modern spiritualism in the 1840s is a rather significant part of our story. After all, the very birth of uh, the spiritualist movement was a reported poltergeist case in a small town called Heightsville in upstate New York. The reported phenomena focused on strange knocks or raps in a little cabin occupied by the Fox family and the sounds seem to revolve around teenage daughters Leah, Kate and Maggie. The knocks attracted the attention of neighbors and soon a simple method was established to communicate with the supposed knocking spirit. Investigators asked questions, spelled out the alphabet and assembled words and sentences from letters that would coincide with a knock. So this is more or less the same method of supposed spirit communication that would uh, later feature in seances using knocking or tilting tables. Once the press caught wind of the case, the Fox sisters were drawn into the limelight and began long and ultimately tragic careers as celebrity mediums. Like so many others who uh, became famous as children, the Fox sisters um, uh, would later struggle with various scandals and alcoholism. Toward the end of their careers in the 1880s, one of the sisters famously declared that um, their phenomena had all been produced by fraud. She later recanted the confession, but by that time spiritualism had already grown into a rather significant global movement anyway. Mainly because of the immense press coverage of the Heightsville case, people from all walks of life try to replicate the phenomena in their home, mostly by trying to obtain responsive knocks or raps in tables or other pieces of furniture. Not much later, the ostensible spirits began writing and speaking through men and women who um, often seemed in a state of trance or of voluntary possession not unlike the shamans of indigenous cultures. Even more spectacular seance phenomena were ostensible materializations of spirit forms, in addition to uh, marvels quite reminiscent of um, poltergeist outbreaks, such as levitations or the sudden appearance and disappearance of various objects. Now, the key feature of the Heightsville case as the supposed cradle of uh, the spiritualist movement is, of course, the, um, the reported responsiveness of the supposed spirit, who uh, uh, seemed quite keen to communicate. 
And if we look back at some older cases, we do sometimes find uh, the same reported feature. For example, in um, a case investigated by Boyle's colleague at the Royal Society and in the Dippesdorf disturbances, which seem to have quite puzzled uh, Lessing in Germany. And for a very good overview of these and other features of poltergeist reports across time and geographic boundaries, I again heartily recommend Gordon Cornell's book as a starting point. And I put an Amazon link in the description box below. Going back to Boyle and some of his colleagues at the Royal Society, um, it's obvious that they were quite convinced that some poltergeist cases were the real thing. But steeped in the profoundly religious mindset of their time, Boyle and others interpreted the phenomena as the work of devils or evil spirits. We are going to return to Boyle and the Royal Society in a later video um, and then take a closer look specifically at these religious scruples. And there will be more videos which will address fears of evil forces and other um, properly religious worries by more recent scientific figures who, unlike Boyle, were fundamentally opposed to empirical investigations of supposedly occult phenomena. So if you haven't already, remember to subscribe to this channel and also click the little bell symbol so you will receive um, notifications each time I upload a new video. Coming back to the 19th century, it seems obvious that disciples of the new spiritualist faith weren't particularly bothered by fears of hell or devils or evil spirits. In fact, one of the great appeals of spiritualism was that in the place of um, eternal damnation and hellfire, it offered a far more um, optimistic cosmology. Neither were spiritualist versions of hell eternal, as even the most wicked soul was uh, believed to be subject to a cosmic law of evolution uh, which allowed it to uh, move forward once regret and a genuine will to be kind kicked in. Of course, the kind of uh, evolution spiritualists had in mind uh, was not exactly the same thing as the modern theory of evolution by natural selection. In fact, Charles Darwin, whose name is commonly associated with modern principles of um, evolution, was fundamentally opposed to spiritualism from the very start. At the same time, Darwin's rather negative stance on spiritualism um, was not quite as representative of uh, contemporary scientific attitudes as traditional popular histories of science would have us believe. After all, Alfred Russell Wallace, um, Darwin's co-discoverer of modern evolutionary principles, was a rather devout spiritualist who didn't exactly make a secret of his um, unorthodox faith. As a spiritualist, Wallace no doubt uh, believed in the reality of poltergeist phenomena, but attributed them um, to undeveloped rather than demonic spirits. Of course, Wallace and spiritualism will be a topic that will occupy us again in the future. For now, let's just say that the relationship between modern evolutionary theory and spiritualism or the occult at large, is a little more complex than popular traditional narratives would have it. And obviously responses to spiritualism by elite scientists other than Wallace is something we are going to come back to again and again. In the meantime, if you're curious uh, about the role of spiritualism in modern British physics, check out the recent book by my colleague Richard Noakes, which I mentioned in a previous video and which is finally available in a more affordable paperback edition. Another celebrity scientist of the time who believed in poltergeist phenomena was the French um, astronomer Camille Flammarion. In fact, in 1923, Flammarion published a collection of poltergeist cases and hauntings, and he was open to the view that some of the alleged um, disturbances might indeed be caused by spirits of the dead. Having said that, Flammarion um, was one of the last major scientific figures who uh, were open to spiritualist interpretations of um, ostensible poltergeist phenomena. Of course, even today, the portrayal of poltergeist phenomena in movies or popular culture at large still overwhelmingly sticks to uh, traditional notions 
um, of the involvement of spirits and ghosts. Steven Spielberg's movie Poltergeist is an obvious instance, and uh, more recent examples might include this. <laughs> To be clear, investigations of supposedly supernatural phenomena, at least since the days of Boyle, typically were attempts to prove the existence of a spirit world with explicitly um, religious aims uh, to promote certain versions of religious faith. However, by the late 1800s, we see a completely novel approach emerge. And this was driven by scientists who were quite often non, if not anti-religious, and who uh, didn't seem very interested in spirits at all. In fact, by the 1920s, uh, that is when Flammarion published his case collection, spiritualist interpretations of poltergeist uh, phenomena were very much on the decline. This is not to say that scientists in the early 20th century had completely stopped taking the phenomena seriously. As we will see in the next episode, some scientists indeed continued investigating reported poltergeist outbreaks, while others tried to make sense of them by developing theoretical frameworks. So in the concluding installment of our history of hidden scientific approaches to poltergeist phenomena, uh, we'll take a closer look specifically at these non-spiritualist investigators. And this will also provide a context to make sense, for example, of this image of Marie Curie at a seance with a medium that was claimed to produce poltergeist-style physical anomalies. In the meantime, let me know if you have any questions about today's episode. And also, of course, don't forget to check out the readings, which I linked to in the description box. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe if you haven't already, give the video a thumbs up, and um, share it with folks who might appreciate it. All of this will really help me grow this channel, as your responses will um, make YouTube's algorithm suggested to new audiences. For now, thank you guys so much for watching and see you next time. Meanwhile, you can do me a favor by staying safe, healthy, and of course magical.